Welcome back, everybody. So we were running a little bit late. It's just one of those things, I guess, that happens at every conference and something that everybody's very used to. Now, I know I introduced you this morning to a uh, lovely, bright, sunny day in Warsaw. There is a thunderstorm currently due. So if you see any fun pyrotechnics going on behind us, that's not because we've installed some kind of exciting sound effects especially for our uh, keynote speaker. It is just simply an effect of the weather. So apologies in advance if anything goes a bit strange on that front. Um, and in order to uh, introduce uh, our illustrious keynote uh, speaker, I would like to ask uh, Professor Kazimierz Lewotowski uh, to give uh, a formal introduction to uh, Dr. Kim Shelton. So please, Kazimierz, uh, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you. I warmly welcome Kim Shelton and other participants of the session. It's real honor and pleasure that you uh, agreed to, to give uh, uh, today's key uh, lecture. Uh, I don't think that uh, Kim Shelton needs uh, a long introduction because we all know her. Uh, she's one of the leading uh, specialists on uh, Mycenaean archaeology. Uh, she completed her uh, MA and PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, but uh, she's working for the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and uh, in many, many other uh, bodies. Uh, her field experience uh, is uh, not only Greece, because I, I found that you also excavated in uh, Maryland, uh, in the 80s, mm, but uh, mostly uh, at Mycenae. Um, uh, Kim Shelton is co-director of this very important uh, project uh, of preservation of uh, Idonia Cemetery. Uh, mm, uh, she's working for Mycenae, uh, Texas House and other sites. Uh, she also uh, worked for the uh, field project uh, in uh, Arcadia, ASEA Valley Survey. Mm, so her e field experience is uh, really very, very wide. Uh, she published uh, uh, the late Hellenic pottery from Prosimna for Paul Ostrom's uh, Verlag. Um, now uh, I understand that. Uh, this year we will read uh, fascicle number 14 of well-built Mycenae. Uh, I'm, I have to say that I'm looking forward to, to read this because it's Tsunta's house. So it's exciting, really. And uh, Petsa's house, it's, I understand you are working on it still, uh, on Petsa's house. Uh, so, uh, today, uh, Kim Shelton will talk on accessing Mycenaean cult inside and outside the palatial context. Kim. Thank you very much for that, that very kind introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. First of all, let's make sure that that, that, that works. As one would hope. Let's see. So hopefully yeah. you're seeing a yes, beautiful yes. light shot of my team. Okay, exactly. good. For step number one. <laughs> step number one. Okay, good. And then I will do this. Great. And hopefully now you see the title, the title slide for yes, the, yes, for the see, accessing my senior card. Wonderful. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. Um First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for the immensely kind invitation to deliver the keynote lecture to the eighth conference in Aegean Archaeology. I only wish that we could be together in person at the conference, but the virtual format does allow access in an unprecedented way, including my own on a kind of sunny California morning when normally I would be in the field in Greece. I chose my topic today, um, accessing Mycenaean cult for several reasons. One of which is my continuing work on Mycenae's cult center. Um, what was just mentioned, the publication of which 
uh, should appear this year at long last. And my ongoing collaboration with Dr. Stephanie Elsebrook on the Cult Center and its publication. Another of my research areas is the mortuary sphere, uh, where ritual action is ubiquitous and preserves the earliest and foundational manifestations of belief across Aegean cultures. As director of the American School Excavations at the Sanctuary of Nemean Zeus, my research questions have been focused on the diachronic nature of cult from the prehistoric period through the early Christian era. So cult and ritual are enmeshed in much of my excavation research and teaching. Although these areas have been of interest from the start of Aegean prehistoric archeology, span there have been constant shifts and changes in evidence and scholarly interpretation. Therefore, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about the cult center, its complex history, evidence for ritual in that context, and using it as a springboard to discuss the wider picture of Mycenaean cult beyond the palatial center. I would also like to take this opportunity to remember Dr. Elizabeth French, my mentor, colleague, and friend who passed away June 10th. It was at Lisa's request that I took on the publication of the British School's excavation at Tsundas House, which was first under the direction of her father, Alan Wace, beginning in 1950. Lisa and I worked together for over 30 years, mostly on pottery, of course, but she must have seen something in me to believe that I could interpret the difficult stratigraphy and multiple excavation programs necessary to provide analysis and chronological and historical context. It certainly helped that I was one of very few individuals who could read her father's handwriting and therefore navigate his notebooks. Lisa was a force of nature, suffered no fools, and made incomparable contributions to Aegean prehistory, Mycenaean pottery and figurines, and especially to the archeology span and historiography of the site of Mycenae. Much of my work and that of many colleagues is a tribute to her and her legacy. I miss her and the inspiration she gave me very much. For this research, I define religion as a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Cult describes a system of religious beliefs and ritual as well as potentially an object of devotion. Ritual is a ceremonial action, an act or series of acts done in accordance with social custom or normal protocol. Ritual can be a mechanism for the shaping of beliefs ideologies and identities, and important in this context, ritual can be a source of social power for those who participate in, control, or create them. So what is Mycenaean religion exactly? Well, difficult question. Uh, going back to Nilsson's seminal work, um, based on religious elements and on the representations and general function of the gods, he believed that many Minoan deities and religious concepts were fused into Mycenaean religion. He also saw this Minoan Mycenaean religion as the ancestor of Greek historical religion. I'm not going to talk about that today. <laughs> By the middle of the 20th century, scholars pushed back against continuity from the prehistoric to historic periods, not only of religion, but of the socio political nature of the culture in general. Since then, scholarship has focused on the details of Minoan and Mycenaean cults with an emphasis on their relative relationship, differences, and of course, the contribution of the former to the latter. As more evidence is found and hopefully published, a more nuanced understanding of ritual and cult is possible just to be, as it becomes even more complex with archeological and textual evidence, and more often now with a chronological resolution which reveals multiple branches of belief many of those branches intersecting and others diverging. Going forward, it may be again time to look more broadly across the Aegean in a holistic cross-cultural context. It remains essential to consider the source of our evidence and remember that the majority of it, whether material or textual, comes from an elite population at a limited number of sites. There remains debate concerning the homogeneity or monolithic nature of Mycenaean religion, or whether there is a distinction between official and popular religions. Alternatively, we might say private versus public cult. 
in support of um, a homogeneity of Mycenaean religion is a core set of ritual practices derived from the Helladic religious tradition, which is enacted at all Mycenaean cult areas. What is evident from the picture of Mycenaean religion that is painted by the archeological evidence differs from that which the Linear B archives, um, both from Pilos and, and even from Knossos, indicate may be attributed to the mixed Helladic and Minoan influences on uh, what we will term Mycenaean religion. With the Minoan elements clearly more concentrated in the palatial centers, which is as many, in many ways has skewed the archeological findings and of course our interpretation of them. Today I'll use Mycenae's cult center to explore cult and ritual within an urban elite context and palatial scale, but also would like to point out the distraction that this type of cult site becomes and move beyond that to look at earlier, wider and more universal rituals. Also I'd like to explore which aspects of both traditional Helladic mainland religion and Minoan religion are incorporated into that of the Mycenaeans, including a look at which Minoan iconography and cult paraphernalia the Mycenaeans chose to adopt, how these fit into the pre-existing religious practices on the mainland, and make some suggestions as to why these selections were made. As Lupak and Whitaker, among others, point out, the archaeological evidence for ritual practice on the mainland in the middle Helladic is scanty, making it difficult to trace the Helladic origins of the Mycenaean religion. The ephemeral nature of evidence is an indication that the Helladic population did not utilize specialized ritual equipment or have an established iconographical tradition in relation to the supernatural. Yet, um, these, uh, uh, what we believe these to be foreshadow the rituals of the Late Bronze Age. Assemblages of pottery, especially oaken shapes, ash and burnt animal bones in association with altar or hearth features indicate communal sacrifice and feasting as core rituals along with libation, certainly. Perhaps indicated in the open vessels and in mortuary assemblages with a preference for jugs and cups. Since specialized vessels like Rita are not adopted from the Minoans until the early Mycenaean period. Iconography is adopted to illustrate pre-existing beliefs as well in the early Mycenaean period. And this is when the growing complexity and burial rituals represent the utilization of ritual activity by the elite to establish and then reinforce claims to sociopolitical power. This is not the first instance that the elite appropriated established cults. The elite of Neoplasia Crete did this with Greek sanctuaries, and it will not be the last time this happens. These ritual practices were clearly continued and remained central to Mycenaean religion in the late Helladic period as evidence for animal sacrifice, libation, and communal feasting is ubiquitous across Mycenaean sanctuary sites. While there's a lack of iconography and writing on the mainland in the middle Helladic period to indicate the worship of male and female deities, their later established pattern of worship could not have been adopted from Crete as the evidence there overwhelmingly points to the predominance of female veneration, if not exclusive. With the addition of the worship of both male and female deities to the previously identified traditional mainland ritual practices of animal sacrifice, libations, and feasting, a clear picture emerges of Helladic ritual practice, uh, what Helladic practice is before a syncretism with Minoan religion. By the late Mycenaean period, newly introduced and mass produced religious paraphernalia, such as handmade female and animal terracotta figurines and undecorated kylikis become pervasive and recognizable Minoan religious iconography has been adopted, adapted and employed in the Mycenaean religious sphere. The fact that this shift from an ephemeral and iconic middle Helladic religion to a paraphernalia focused and iconography laden Mycenaean religion occurred during the early stages of the Mycenaean state formation process suggests that these two occurrences are related. Moreover, the adoption of Minoan religious iconography in the early Mycenaean pre-palatial period indicates that not only did mainland religion see a shift, uh, but religion itself may have been a crucial tool utilized by the uh, rising uh, Mycenaean uh, elites to establish and maintain their power in this new state. And for other adoptions 
for from Crete in this same vein, we of course can look to the materials uh, that were used for conspicuous consumption in burials at the time, the eventual control of, uh, of the exchange of prestige goods and organizational features of a state system seen in linear B tablets, of course, as a system of bureaucratic organization. So this is just one of many things, um, but one that perhaps hasn't been given as much attention. In this new Mycenaean religion, uh, distinctly Minoan iconography appears on the mainland, such as representations of Minoan altars, for example, on the Lion Gate at Mycenae and horns of consecrations. Here's one example depicted in the room of the fresco uh, in the cult center, which we'll look at more fully in a bit. The most important Minoan cult objects that were adopted by the Mycenaeans already in the early Mycenaean period seem to have been the riton and the tripod offering table, both of which um, likely used for libation rituals. These two cult objects were select selectively adopted over you know, a much larger corpus of possibilities became popular quickly and were easily incorporated into the pre-existing Helladic ritual practice. Meanwhile, Mycenaean elites were using Minoan symbols at what we might term prestige iconography to create and control religious ideology, um, which, of, which in turn served to establish power, legitimize their own status and distinguish themselves from the rest of society. Jack Davis and Sharon Stocker have recently expressed a similar relationship of Minoan religious symbolism used to legitimize power and iconography and finds from the early Mycenaean grave of the Griffin warrior at Pylos. By incorporating the prestige elements in this way, the ruling class was still able to participate in the same religion as the rest of the Mycenaean society, um, therefore maintaining a kind of monolithic or homogeneity. It was through this process of differentiation and simultaneous religious continuity that the elites were able to establish a religious system based on degrees of inclusivity and exclusivity, a controlling a management of participation in ritual. So far as we know, shrine buildings only appear at the time of the first palaces on the mainland. The Megaron II develops as a central locus of ritual action with hearth and libation features, but with very restrictive and very selective access. Sanctuaries begin to be built close to palace and urban centers in smaller settlements, but also in the rural landscape, especially on peaks and in caves, locales often said to be exclusive to Minoan Crete. I will explore further below the distinctions that have been observed between palatial cult centers and rural sanctuaries, which can be attributed to attempts potentially by the elite class um, to create uh, or, or cultivate this exclusion uh, exclusion system of cult and establish themselves um, as, a, as a, a higher class, a, a hierarchy. So, as physical shrines and sanctuaries developed, how independent from the palace administration were they? Were the shrines financially independent? Can we reconstruct the relative amounts of power, both economic, economic and political, that the palatial and religious sectors wielded in respect to each other? From the Linear B tablets, we know that the palace sent offerings to sanctuaries outside of the palaces fulfilling their ritual obligations for sure, but also providing a source of support, potentially. Typical offerings include perfumed oil, honey, spices, all of which we, I would suggest are used in cultic contexts, but also livestock, wine, cheese, and other foodstuffs for ritual sacrifices and communal ceremonial banquets, which would have followed. Only occasionally are values, uh, valuables offered, such as gold cups, and human service. Also, grain and figs are provided possibly as rations for the needs of ritual and support of personnel. There's also apparently a pattern of provisions during periodic short festivals rather than basic full-time support. In fact, it's significant that only about 10% of the palace's economic resources were allocated to the religious sphere. The remaining resources must come from other parties including from self-generated resources. Many scholars have turned to the evidence from the cult center at Mycenae to answer questions about Mycenaean religion and its rituals, since it's the most impressive of the excavated Mycenaean sanctuaries so far. The cult center is located midway along the lower western slope 
of the fortified citadel. It consists of five independent structures, all of them probably religious in nature with access to the area by gated ramp and stairway. Descending the slope from east to west, the structures are Shrine Gamma, the Megaron, the Temple, the Room of the Fresco Complex. The remaining building is the so-called Sundas House, the function of which is not easily defined, primarily due to its early excavation in 1886 by the excavator after whom it, it is named and the lack of recorded finds. Also important to the makeup of the center are its points of access, the causeway ramp from the north, the processional ramp from the east, the stairway K on the south, and the exterior courtyard with the circular altar at the lowest level on the west. Other peripheral structures might be included uh, in the cult center, but the lack of artifact remains or published evidence leaves much room for dispute. I would argue that their orientation away from the center is significant and argues against inclusion. The cult center buildings define a space by being oriented inward towards each other. Most will be familiar with the area generally and also have some knowledge of specific finds or details of evidence, the majority of which is, is still unpublished, but, but getting there. The chronology of the center is not very well understood especially the various phases of construction, use, and destruction. As a result of the recent in-depth study for the final publication of the Sundas House area, a more detailed and nuanced understanding um, of the history of the cult center is possible. The Sundas House area includes both the origin of the cult center with the earliest identified religious installation at Mycenae and its fullest development as an organized and controlled precinct within the Citadel. The rituals practiced either in individual buildings or across the entire center are also open to interpretation. However, the examination of features and objects can provide some significant insights. Briefly, going back to 1886, uh, most of Sundas' efforts were directed towards the house on the middle and lower levels, which he cleared completely and published most fully in a report in, in the Practica uh, of that same year. On the upper terrace, he only partially cleared another earlier structure, removing just the uppermost layers over the entire building to reveal the outer walls, and then clearing to bedrock the room on the south end, which was uh, termed by him Gamma. This structure, now called the Shrine or Shrine Gamma, was fully investigated by the British in the 1950s while the remainder of the cult center was excavated by the British over several campaigns in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and as I mentioned, is being published in the well-built Mycenae series. The site was dug yet again by the Archaeological Society of Athens under the direction of Milanas in the early 1970s with expanded excavation to the Southeast and West. Although some brief reports of these findings are in print, most are misleading or completely outdated. When most people think of the cult center of Mycenae, they think of it in exactly that way, the palatial religious center within the Citadel Acropolis of Mycenae, with five independent structures, internal and external ritual areas, and the processional ramped approach from the palace at the summit of the hill, it has become the type site for Mycenaean palatial cult and a phenomenon of the LH3B 13th century palatial system uh, including the Citadel's expansion at that time. The problem with this reconstruction is that the center never existed in that way that we picture it, especially as presented in state plans and views. There are five complex structures. There are monumental approaches. There is a fortification wall enclosing it within a Citadel, but they're never actually a total package, neither at the inception of the sites used for religious practice, nor at the time of the final destruction by earthquake at the end of the LH3B2 period, um, just at the cusp of the start of the 12th century BCE. Following the widespread use of the hill's west slope for habitation and burial during the Middle Helladic period, the systematic construction of cult buildings begins with Shrine Gamma in the early 14th century in a sparsely populated area on a steep slope of unleveled rock, a bit south of the ramp house and even further along from the old dilapidated Royal Cemetery, Grave Circle A, but definitely outside the walls of the late Helladic 3A Citadel. 
The approaches to the building were probably from below, downslope, and may have been linked to the roadways approaching the citadel from the southwest. Early ramp surfaces ascend the slope toward the north entrance of the building. By the time the full group of structures has been built towards the middle of the 13th century, the shrine was joined by the Megaron and Sundas house, two, two, two multi-storied structures with rectangular hearths and extensive basement storage. And a lower level around a central open space, the temple and room of the fresco, two independent building complexes, also with clear indication of cult use. The area could then be approached up the stairs K to the south of the house um, uh, from the north by way of the early 13th century causeway through the roofed and plastered corridor east of the South House Annex. And, and perhaps most importantly, from the west through the open court with the circular altar. The additional structures were built in apparent succession from the later part of the 14th century to the middle of the 13th century. All it would seem before the construction of the fortification wall, probably in the third quarter of the 13th century BCE. So let's look a little more in detail. Shrine Gama was a Mycenaean cult building that for part of its history at least included the older, smaller room to the south, um, per, this one here, Gama, perhaps we might term that an adaton, and for storage of ritual paraphernalia, including what I believe is the cult icon, the famous painted plaster plaque with an apparently divine figure wearing a large figure of eight shield flanked by two women in flounce skirts. And uh, in addition, votive offerings consisting of fragmentary objects of glass, bone, ivory, and amber, plus a scarab of queen tea. Comparable finds, votive scraps and exotica, were found um, also in other cult center buildings, such as the Megaron, room 32, and room 19. The north room of the shrine has clear cult, clear cult use, especially um, in the earlier of two distinct stages of construction and use, each represented by a plaster floor, the upper floor here, what's remains post-excavation um, and, uh, and the lower, lower floor, with a specialized and unique plaster libation altar built into the earlier floor in the early 14th century as a permanent focus of ritual action. The altar was set close to and in front of the entrance to room Gama, emphasizing the importance of the inner part of the shrine. The altar is built up of successive and alternating layers of green plesha clay, a waterproof uh, local clay, and white lime plaster, most closely described as horseshoe shaped, uh, with a slightly concave upper surface and two projecting elements on the west side, a semicircular basin or stand and a clay bolster projecting horizontally. In between these two features is a plaster groove that sloped towards the mouth of a large two on bedrock, the rim flush with the floor surface. My internet said I was unstable. Hopefully I'm still, still projecting here. Um, uh, let's see. So the basin, uh, yes, and the large three-handled uh, jar set beneath the floor on, with rim flush with the floor surface. Nearby was a large three-handled flat-bottomed tray of burnished but otherwise undecorated fine ware, most likely for offerings. The accommodations for catching liquid indicate libation offering as at least one of the primary uses of the altar and by extension of the shrine in its early phase. The floor consists of only one layer of thin and carefully made plaster, suggesting that the interior of the shrine was not subject to substantial traffic and that entrance into the entrance into the room was permitted to only very few, possibly only the religious functionaries. The room could perhaps have accommodated around 10 very thin individuals if they stood very close together. Um, a major alteration of the shrine took place uh, at the earliest during the middle of late Helladic 3b with the covering of the earlier ritual features and the laying of a new plaster floor. Related to this phase is the placement through the earlier floor onto bedrock a large of a large stone in front of the altar. Its purpose is unclear, the, although past suggestions include a pillar base and a slaughtering stone. 
The complete lack of features and finds in the upper shrine room signals an important change in the use of the space. Um, from the obvious emphasis on internal ritual and limited access and visibility by anyone other than the close per closest participants to a focus on the exterior of the structure, to its porch or forecourt area where a stone-based L-shaped al uh, altar and plaster platform were constructed around this time. From the plastered court to its north, Participants could have easily viewed the proceedings while additional participants of various socio-political status levels may have been able to view the proceedings from various vistas on the upper ramp, middle ramp, and from the roofs and windows of the Megaron and house on the lower terrace to the west. The Ashler altar may also have been used for libation or as a table of offerings. There was likely a continuity of function from phase to phase, even if the location shifts a persistence of ritual practice. There also continues a strong emphasis on the division between inner and outer space, albeit reversed in focus. However, those in real proximity to the action would not have been many more than those able to fit inside the shrine in the earliest phase. It was at this spot that the ramped processional way terminated, but not until the LH3B2 period late in the 13th century. The shrine building was destroyed by fire not long after that, uh, similar to the end of neighboring buildings and most likely connected to the same event at the very end of the 3B period on the cusp of 3C in the early 12th century BCE. Let's briefly look at the rest of the center. The Megaron was built very early in the 13th century and exhibits two construction phases, at least before its destruction. The Sundas house uh, was built only shortly after the Megaron, also in two phases. Both structures were multi-storied with an upper suite of rooms, including one um, of Megaron plan with a central square hearth over completely or in part basement storage rooms. In the case of the Megaron, these contain pottery, scrap ivory, boar's tusks, glass jewelry, stone sword pommels, et cetera. The Megaron was entered from the middle ramp of the processional way over a well-cut threshold of polished stone, and the Sundas house was accessed by way of the narrow and exclusive lower ramp alongside the Megaron. Both buildings were destroyed by fire during the general destruction of the cult center. Based on architectural design, the most straightforward interpretation of the function of these two buildings is habitation domestic structures built in close proximity to a cluster of buildings that were used primarily, if not exclusively, for cults. The Megaron contained the same type of votive scrap and exotica found in the more clearly cult-used structures, however, and as a result, has been assumed to be another of the religious buildings in the center. I would agree. Its architectural similarities in proximity to Sunda's house may indicate a close functional relationship. The house may be interpreted as religious by association at the very least, but little in the physical makeup of the building, its features or movable artifacts would suggest that the building was actually used for cult. However, everything about the structure suggests it's more than simply a house. It was suggested by Waste to be the residence of the priest in charge, due primarily to the physical proximity and structural relationship to the shrine. And although the house is a separate independent structure, the interpretation may be valid, although I would say the priestess in charge when we look at the plethora of female deities represented in this cult center. Uh, the building may still be considered domestic and yet religious if it is the habitation for the official residence of the cult center. The heterogeneous nature of the multiple cult buildings make it likely that it housed a number of religious functionaries. Another interpretation for the use of the house, and I would say the same could be true for the Megaron, is as a hall, or what we would typically classify as a Megaron, that could be used for the congregation of participants in celebration of rituals or festivals in the cult center complex. The variation of structures, symbols, and rituals understood from the many buildings and features along the slope suggest a hodgepodge of cult needs and a scattered schedule of ritual alongside more regular events. In this way, the domestic characteristics of the building can be understood in the context 
of a complex of cult buildings and ritual. Both buildings were constructed. Let's see. Oh, this was the entrance to Suda's house. Both buildings were constructed over an earlier 14th century BC access ramp from the terrace of the shrine descending to an open area at the bottom of the slope that included a round altar of clay and stone with evidence of burned animal bone and a shallow stoa roofed with schist slabs. Next to be built still early in the 13th century was probably the room of the fresco complex. It originally consisted of a central room with an elaborate hearth and wood columns at either end. Approached from a passage on its east side, alterations soon after the initial building phase relocated the entry to the northwest corner from an anteroom, where a clay larnax was positioned for ritual cleansing. At the same time, a small shrine was built on the east and at the wall south of its entrance was frescoed in two registers with multiple divine and, and likely official human figures pictured in an architectural setting. The scenes are set above and alongside a tall platform altar that was painted with Minoan horns of consecration on its end and equipped with a series of basin shaped burnt offering receptacles. Nearby on the floor was pottery, mostly cooking uh, pottery and storage uh, pottery uh, or storage vessels, a lead vessel in fact, and an heirloom faience Egyptian plaque, a Cretan stone bowl, an ivory pommel and lion, an ivory male head, possibly a cult image um, in, this, in this location. The inner shrine room on the east was full of scrap objects, especially of ivory and glass votive material presented to the type A figure of a goddess with upraised arms on a low clay and plaster dais in the far inner southwest corner. Veneration of cold images and the presentation of votives, most of it fragmentary high value scrap, heirlooms and exotica are clearly part of the ritual in the complex and is likely the subject commemorated on the fresco itself. The prominent central hearth, the cooking vessels and the receptacles for burnt offerings indicate the preparation of a ritual meal. The main part of the complex went out of use following the first disaster in the middle of 3B. The fresco was whitewashed over, the room filled with fine soil, and a series of stone slabs were set over the area of the altar. It was never used in 3B2, and the complete inaccessibility of the rooms following the construction of the fortification wall may have been a contributing factor. The same is true for the Western Court and its circular altar, filled in, covered over, not visible, not used. Um, after the fortification wall is built. This approach to the lower level buildings only works if there is no fortification wall. It was not used after the earthquake destruction and was covered with a thick layer of plush of clay. The temple or room of the idols was the last of the group to be built in the first half of the 13th century and of course followed a similar series of construction phases. It consists of uh, two to three ground floor rooms opening onto the court and an internal staircase to a small storeroom on a higher level. The main room had a low central platform for dry offerings. There's no evidence of burning there. Three columns flanked the stairs along the east side of the room and a series of small benches or platforms of various heights along the north side and northwest corner. At the east end of these feature features was found in situ a red painted type B figure, one of 27 unique to this building and a small portable circular altar. Like Shrine Gama, it went through major alterations following the earthquake in the middle of the period. This mainly involved the burying of the type A, type B and coiled snake figures along with pottery and votive scraps in the small room at the top of the stairs behind a brick and plaster seal and in an alcove with an exposed bedrock outcrop to its northwest. The temple then remained in use until the final destruction of the cult center. A veneration of cult images, in this case movable figures, is certainly indicated here. Their display directed the attention of celebrants to a segment of the room and acted as, as a focus for votive gifts of now familiar makeup. The different types of figures have been interpreted as goddesses and their worshipers, and it's been suggested that they could have been used for display outside of the building as part of a procession. 
Significance was retained after their functional lifespan following extensive breakage during the earthquake. The figures and the votives were disposed of ritually within the margins of the structure itself. Until the construction of the West Cyclopean Wall after the middle of late Helladic 3b, the cold center was potentially accessible from any point outside the citadel. Plaster surfaced ramps seemed to bring traffic to the entrance of Shrine Gama, isolated in this period, and then along the slope and perhaps up towards the entrance to the earlier citadel, the precursor to the Lion Gate in the area later covered by the Great Ramp. Access from further up the hill and from the early citadel could also have been by these routes. During the long um, and prolific building phase in early uh, 3B, internal circulation between terraces and among buildings is the focal priority. And the area becomes a center for the first time as the individual structures are interconnected in a planned uh, and rooted way. The routes and interconnected access ways were also altered with the construction of complex buildings and the strong terraces that supported them. Access and entrance to the center seems open and fairly unrestricted until after the middle of 3B, after the earthquake destruction of that phase, when the West Cyclopean Wall is built across this part of the slope and the center becomes an internal part of the citadel. Up to this point, the buildings could have been seen and approached from all directions on the hill, with the most limited approach perhaps being from that from up the slope. While the activities and rituals acted out within the structures were invisible and restricted to small numbers of individuals. The West Cyclopean Wall closes free and unrestricted access to the cult center from the West and limits visibility of the external areas as well. The Mycenaean built landscape influences arenas of social performance and access to the cult center from within the Citadel creates nodes of possible ritual action as the road beginning at the Lion Gate passes the Grave Circle and then branches downward through the causeway toward the cult center and eventually upward toward the Megaron complex. The processional way was built from the Patlas directly down the west slope of the citadel to the cult center just after the earthquake destruction, possibly about 1230 BCE. It enters the lower west slope with a flight of 14 steps and a landing which makes a 180 degree turn to descend to the north along a ramp that was roofed and frescoed with a procession scene matching its function. Access to the area was then limited by the construction of a gateway with a large conglomerate threshold block with circular cuttings for double doors that opened down the ramp towards the cult center, indicating from where the traffic was anticipated. Beyond the ramp, uh, continues, uh, here's the, with the gateway, beyond, the ramp continues to descend to the north until it meets the roofed causeway corridor behind the South House Annex and again turns 180 degrees to the south, leading to Shrine Gama and the external Ashler Altar. While this configuration was established late in the construction history of the Citadel, the reorientation of the approach offers a rare glimpse into the purposeful renegotiation of ritual space. So when all the buildings were up and running, there was no wall. And when the wall was built at the end of uh, the, after say the beginning of 3B2, there was uh, no room of the fresco and no courtyard altar. There was also no ramp processional way. Ironically, the two things that make this the cult center of the Acropolis are the fortification wall and the processional way both of which are among the last features constructed. The complex started out as a single building outside the physical palatial setting and would likely have been easily accessible by a more public constituency. Access is never more important or controlled than when the cult center becomes a physical part of the palatial sphere. The emphasis becomes the procession down into the center through multiple physical and visual barriers and increasingly restricted access towards the shrine, culminating in an open plastered court. The use of a court recalls those of the palace that were not open to the public, where a limited capacity served as another form of control in addition to physical boundaries and barriers. Participants in the procession would have thus been called and corralled as they progressed, and then spectator or participant would have been granted certain and different privileges visual or physical access to some important moment 
and the granting and deprivation of those privileges were built into the spectacle itself. It is at this stage that the cult center becomes physically connected to the palace, while conceptually, the monumentalizing of the entrance, including an ashlar threshold, underlines the conceptual connection as a marker of the sequence of the procession and the potential roadblocks to status and station. The cult center of Mycenae should, should indeed be termed a sanctuary, one within an urban context to be sure, but an intricate organization of ritual space with a deliberate arrangement of buildings and open areas designed and furnished according to differentiated function. It might be understood as Albers has termed public communal cult, where ritual is highly heterogeneous due to the variety of individual deities housed in separate structures or even fundamentally different connotations of a single deity, which is something we've come to debate about both Minoan and Mycenaean cults. Based on our current understanding of the iconography and cult images in several buildings of the center, a number of goddesses were housed and venerated here. Um, and the nature of the female deities is somewhat sometimes redundant and could be reflected in the female figures and images, some with a strong emphasis on fertility, while others are identified by weapons and armor. Um, the, I wanted to be there, sorry. <laughs> um, the early and complicated history of Shrine Gama leads us to a new assessment of the cult center and the implications for the nature and character of the cult practice there. We can no longer speak of an exclusive private religious precinct designed and built for the use of the privileged few. Perhaps more importantly, we can now see a shift in the character of the religion through changes in ritual design, differential access, and with the incorporation of the center into the sphere of palatial control. The cult center and sacred way, as I mentioned, were destroyed at the end of late Helladic 3b2, early in the 12th century BCE, by fire and collapse, probably as the result of yet another earthquake, although it seems more localized than the one in the middle of 3b. There's no evidence for repair or rebuilding following the destruction. And in fact, there's good evidence for exposure of the ruins and erosion down the slope of debris in large masses over a few generations before the area was used, was reclaimed and, re and used for habitation um, throughout the later 12th century BCE. The ritual landscape is usually very conservative and amazingly persistent. So the complete abandonment of a cult area is remarkable. The collapse of the palatial administration would naturally have affected the cult center. And it's interesting that the practice of ritual does not revert to a more accessible popular use. This could uh, have been the result either because the cult center had always been an official communal sanctuary uh, dependent primarily on the palace or its cults and rituals were at that point too far removed from the collective memory more than 200 years beyond its origins. I've referred to different types of cult today private, public, individual, communal, urban, and rural. Even while coexisting as branches within Mycenaean religion, chrono chronologically, there are certainly shifts in trends. The changes in, in Mycenae's cult center from its inception to its destruction illustrate this. And that is totally a phenomenon of the, uh, the palatial period of the late Mycenaean period. Uh, so that doesn't even take into account the changes that I mentioned from the early Mycenaean period. The cult center, as I, as I suggest, also distracts us from a broader, more inclusive view of ritual and belief beyond the palatial centers. The indication that the palace systematically co-opted religion, um, as of course elites have been doing since the early Mycenaean period, with an emphasis on both inclusion and exclusion, emphasizes that traditional ritual was ongoing and pervasive um, everywhere uh, throughout uh, the Mycenaean world. A review of the main iconography at the cult center clearly demonstrates that female figures predominate and that several of these figures likely represent the deities who were worshiped in the sanctuary. The evidence from the linear B tablets, of course, not, not from Blancini, but primarily from Pilos and others from Knossos, um, these tablets paint a rather different picture. Names of deities appear on the tablets as the recipients of offerings. What is striking in comparison to the evidence from the cult center is that the names of both male and female deities occur. Hermes, Zeus, Hera, and Poseidon, to name a few. There's reference also to the Poseidon, which was a shrine where Poseidon was the presiding deity. 
Mycenaean religion included the worship of both male and female gods and clearly included sanctuaries dedicated to male deities. The concept of a goddess-dominated religion that the center's iconography suggests is not a truly accurate representation of the religion as a whole. The discrepancies observed between the textual and archaeological evidence may well be attributed to this gradual chronological mix of Holatic and Minoan influences on Mycenaean cult, where the Minoan elements are in fact more concentrated in the palatial centers. The comparison of palatial and rural sanctuaries is necessary to further elucidate the inclusive, exclusive nature of the religious system. Uh, for example, the concentration of Minoan-inspired uh, iconography of the citadels of Mycenae, Tyrians, and Pylos has reflected the exclusive end of this spectrum. While the material evidence from a sanctuary, such as that is Ayos Constantinos on Methana, which only includes one female figurine, and without Minoan iconography, suggests that this site likely represents the rural inclusive counterpart to the cult center. Excavation of the site has uncovered a complex of rooms, including one of primarily cultic function, since it was actually multiple, but one uh, primarily cultic function, since it was outfitted with a bench and a central dais and contained a significant number of Mycenaean terracotta figurines. The majority of which were bovids together with horses and combination figurines of ridden and driven oxen and horses. Kansalaki, the excavator, has proposed that the nature of the deity who was worshipped here can be understood from the very selective and redundant offerings present. She suggests the primary cult of a male deity and that the figurines indicate that that deity was involved with horses and cattle. There's evidence of burnt animal sacrifice and fe feasting as well as pouring of libations with the use of rita. The worshipers here were participating in the core ritual practices derived from the traditional Hellenic main religion. At the same time, the extensive use of figurines signals a connection, a possible connection, I'd say likely connection, to the organized ritual expression introduced at the start of the palatial period, potentially as an in inclusive device for the masses to iconographically represent all purpose ritual and offerings in private and public contexts. Figurines and kylikes, especially undecorated varieties, are introduced and mass produced in connection uh, to the co-opting of religious ritual and are central objects in the inclusion exclusive program. They represent standardization and organization of ritual that suggests a common central authority, one that at Mycenae will literally co-opt the areas of cult. Another example very briefly is the peak sanctuary at Mount Lycaon with this extensive ash altar and finds of kylikes and figurines is an example in a rural sanctuary context. Um, the continuity of ritual into the historical period at the ash altar of Zeus, the later ash altar of Zeus, indicates an extramural sanctuary to very likely a male deity. And of course, uh, same is true at the Palo Maliatis um, above Epidaurus. It is worth mentioning the, in, the inclusive exclusive nature of religious spectacles in Mycenaean cult, including processions and communal feasting. Both group rituals allow for various levels of participation and observation. Both activities can also take place in palatial or rural settings. With the design and mass production of carinated kylikes and bowls, palatial centers saw to it that all levels of society were able to participate in the same types of feasting events and presumably processions, which would have created a small sense of unity among all members. At the same time, however, the various levels of feasting and procession experience, which ranged from fully inclusive to highly exclusive, allowed the elites to differentiate and separate themselves from the lower classes, emphasizing their wealth and power. As I already discussed in reference to the creation of a ramped processional way at the cult center during the final monumentalized construction phase of the increasingly exclusive ritual landscape. In conclusion, clearly there are distinct differences in the material evidence between sanctuary sites located at the palatial citadels and those that are located near smaller settlements and in rural areas. But these differences do not constitute separate different religions. There's a core set of ritual practice derived from Hellenic religious tradition, which are enacted at all Mycenaean cult areas and therefore constitute um, a homogenous Mycenaean religion. Regional variability certainly exists in terms of the deities that are worshipped and the iconography that is chosen, but the core practices seem to be universal across the Mycenaean world. 
The differences observed, particularly in the iconography and the textual evidence, um, the, uh, especially about the deities that are being worshipped between palatial centers and rural sanctuaries, are the result of strategic selection and adoption um, of religious iconography by the elites in order to legitimize their status and power, potentially during um, a, a developing state formation process. The result, Aegean cults. And I would consider that, and I would suggest that we've come full circle to look at the commonalities of ritual and the interconnected branches and cross-pollination of belief and its expression visually and experientially through the Bronze Age. Thank you very much. Kim, that was fantastic. Thank you. It, re it really was an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you so much. So much very food for thought there. So many, I mean, you know, you gave me a quick overview of what you were planning to say uh, yesterday, um, but, I, you know, I couldn't imagine how, how brilliant that was. Um, you covered so many different topics. You brought in so many important elements of how religion functions in a society. And you did, you know, what all of us who work on the cult center really try and emphasize is that what everybody sees on these plans is not really what the cult center actually was. I can see here that quite a lot of people are expressing their appreciation of your talk through the um, applause buttons and so on <laughs> and so forth. And I'm sure that uh, there will be a few questions and we do have a very small amount of uh, additional time, despite the fact that we were running late. So if you don't okay. mind, Kim, um, you know, we uh, we do open the floor up to anybody who would like to ask uh, Kim a question after that uh, amazing talk. Uh, and just to uh, set the ball rolling, I guess, in order to uh, give people uh, well, a, a couple of minutes to digest all of that because you know you did, as I say, there is a lot, great, there is a, a lot. great deal of material that I mean that was that was as I say truly fantastic. But um, and I'm going to try and avoid hogging the, the discussion as well because quite frankly, you and I could talk about the cult center together for the next twelve hours and nobody would be able to stop us. So I'm going to be as restrained <laughs> as possible uh, in, in this, but. Um, what I wanted to ask you uh, about was as the um, shrine that Waste believed belonged to the palace um, and mm -hmm. uh, how you feel that that, if it did exist, I'm not quite sure what your opinion is on that particular uh, structure, how, how uh, you feel that may have uh, interconnected with the cult center. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's very difficult from the early excavations to isolate structures that that are of um, f exclusively religious use. Let's put let's put it that way. There are a lot of locations, including I showed um, the the one with the ivory triad of the three figures that comes from the summit of the hill. Uh, which which was also identified as potentially a religious area based on that that fine, but you know it's essentially within within the palace itself. So so why not why not have um, as we pointed out the Megaron, um, and I think it's it's interesting that a lot of these areas, including what what Waste was identifying, uh, are are probably dating slightly early, on the earlier side too. So when you have the, the beginning of cult buildings still with quite open access in what will become the cult center, there are areas within the Citadel, properly within the Citadel, that are also being used for various different cult activities. Um, but by the time you get to the later part of 3B, and we have the, the cult center operating as this in, you know, exclusive area. Most of the, the um, we really reduce in the number of places we can point to within the Citadel elsewhere and say, this seems to be functioning in sh as, a, as a shrine, the only or for cult. I mean, obviously the Megaron continues. I think that it, though it has a quite specific and as I mentioned, super restrictive focus. 
but there's also um, an area on the north slope you probably are are aware of course connected to house me on the north slope that Vassal Pliatica um, is publishing that clearly has a, a small room full of including a type A figure and the types of votives that we see in the cult center. So there was, and that goes through to, to the end of 3B as well. So there are still little pockets of places how private they were, whether they were attached to a household complex um, within the Citadel, that would be wonderful to know. I mean, eventually, hopefully a lot of the stuff will get published and we'll know more about the overall function of the neighborhoods as well. But I think I do think that some of it coexisted, that it's more scattered. And then as there becomes a more centralization of focus, then there's less of it scattered around. Thank you. I mean, I, I completely agree that we do need to get all of this stuff published because it's uh, yeah. incredibly interesting. Um, uh, and uh, very important for understanding how, how Mycenae functioned and, and yet mm -hmm. you know, still too much of it remains unpublished. Well, I'm afraid at the moment everybody seems to be quite shy, um, so uh, I, I will keep on talking um, <laughs> because... <laughs> Because as I say, you know, I have a very long list of questions to that I could easily put to you for, you know. Go for it, go for it. Yeah, all right, I, I will, I will. If there's nobody else, I will. So um, <laughs> my next question to you, Kim, uh, slightly uh, different going back to the cult centre in particular. Now, um, why, why that area was chosen for uh, a, for cult in the first place. So we're talking what, 3A2, that suddenly, I mean, I know what's underneath the Megaron and what's underneath the Megaron are a few walls uh, and then a whole bunch of fill. Uh, whatever was mm -hmm. there was just completely obliterated. It wasn't wanted. We've got that strange deposit of feasting stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. what is that uh, underneath the wall that happens to divide the Megaron from Suntas house? Uh, what, why, why build a shrine there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so the, the shrine gamma is being, is already under construction in 3A1. So it's still, again, may, they were probably starting to build a palace at the same time. Um, and I think there was more of a focus on the, the, um, the entrance, the access to the upper heights of the, of the site. Um, previous to the construction of a palace, there does seem to be some kind of mansion, some kind of um, elite structure at the top of the at the top of the hill, but the organization of the site doesn't suggest that it's all about that. And I think it's important that where sh the shrine is built flanks what we think is the, the, fir the earlier approach to the, to the um, Acropolis Hill. So it, it, is, it is a good location for people to be, for, to be seen and for people to come through the neighborhood they're going to. Uh, and of course we still, I, I, Grave Circle A was not yet being monumentalized at that point but it but it still would have been there invisible people would have known it was there so you have kind of a um think about cult think about the ancestors and then potentially connecting to other things that were going on at the time and i imagine that it would have been fully endorsed by those that were constructing the first palace that this be built on the lower slopes. It, it, I don't believe that it was totally just some random person said, oh, this is a good spot, let's build here. That it was absolutely endorsed, but it, it definitely suggests um, a different concept of what that could mean um, when it was built. And, it, and of course it sat there for a very long time as the only cult building, which I think is also interesting that it really, um, if this was gonna be a main focus of even one cult or, or several different deities, uh, that really hadn't solidified. It took it a long time for that to actually, you know, become uh, a program, a planned, a planned construction. 
So I don't know if that, that answers you. My sense is that it is, it has to do with the approach, the pathway that, that was originally entered. It's not far from where the original entrance up to the upper part of the hill would have been located. No, I, I think that makes a, a great deal of sense. And particularly if we look at lots of other uh, Mycenaean sites, we can see the same idea that things which are considered significant are being put along approaches and, you know, therefore mm -hmm. understanding access and how people were moving around mm -hmm. the landscape is definitely mm -hmm. one of the key things to understanding Mycenae, Mycenaean religion and perhaps, as you point out, Aegean religion uh, as a whole. Um, still, I mean, and it would have been, and I would say, I would just add, it would be, would have been, of course, a good spot for um, at least partial visibility at the time, because you do have a roadway, you do have fairly open, um, lightly, I'd say lightly terraced um, slope around the area. So even if there was a, a cult activities going inside the building in that, in the first, in the first long part of its life lots of people, very unrestricted numbers of people really could gather around outside and, and observe it, be part of that activity, part of that spectacle. Yes, indeed. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Everyone else seems still to be in complete awe. Not that I'm not in complete awe of you, Kim, but uh, I mean, so, so much so that it is totally silenced them. Um, so I, I will keep going, um, but I will do my best to try and keep the discussion as general as possible. Um, and so um, my next question to you, Kim, uh, is going to move beyond just thinking about my scene. You need to talk about this idea you're talking about, the uh, difference between rural, urban, for example, pointing out, you know, as somebody has to, that we do have these cave and these peak sanctuaries going on on the Greek mainland. And on uh, Crete, um, and this may be slightly out of date, but I believe it's still relevant. The idea is, is that during the proto-palatial, there was quite a bit of peak sanctuaries being built. And as we move into the neo-palatial, it's almost as if the uh, palatial elites decide to kind of seize the landscape, uh, the, the ritual landscape, or maybe even in terms of territory as well, um, and uh, take over the peak sanctuaries. And you see a sudden like diminishing in the number of peak sanctuaries and you know, so on and so forth. So I was wondering right. whether the peak sanctuaries that you see on the Greek mainland, are they more similar to the proto-palatial ones, the near-palatial ones? Do we see some kind of trends in the way that perhaps the elite decided to appropriate the the rural religious landscape at any point on the Greek mainland? Well, it's, it's interesting because of course, there's a lot out there that need to be, to be published so we can fully understand their chronological trajectory as well. But they, they, are, they are different. You know, they're, they're on summits, not always the highest peak, like Crete in a lot of cases. Um, but they they do tend to be slightly different. Now, speaking of the um, the sanctuary at Apollo Maliatis, there's fairly strong evidence that it goes back into the Middle Hellenic period, so the Middle Bronze Age, which would make it more contemporary with the more prolific time period of peak sanctuaries on Crete, and perhaps some of the other ones like the Lycaon may well go back that early as well, although the strongest evidence that I've seen to date um, puts, it, puts it slightly later. But there's definitely a strong emphasis on, um, on ash burning, on, on burning, you know, burning a bur ash altars, uh, animal sacrifice, uh, creating these, these ash altars, different things going on with, with specific parts of animals. Um, and I, that seems from what I've seen that mostly stays the same. The only thing that changes remarkably in the material record is that when we have the introduction of figurines that on the mainland, because we, we don't use, even though they're being used, of course, different, different kinds and often bronze figurines um, in, on Crete, we, where they're not being used up until the late Helladic period on the mainland. And when they do, these are, these are places that then receive them in fairly significant numbers. And that's true for 
the cave sites as well. I would say one similarity and another thing that's, that changes on Crete um, along with that change in peak sanctuaries is we go from a more sanction, you know, a worship in the depths of a cave, right? Really deep in, in the earlier period to a more shallow, more potentially visible cult that happens in rock shelters rather than deep on the interior during the neoplatial period. And I would say, um, most of the caves that I that I've seen are more like that. They're on the mainland. They're more like the rock shelter version that is towards the entrances of the caves, and not necessarily only in the, the deep dark interior of the cave. So I wonder if there's also again if that's a, a phenomenon from that period. And they're mostly recognized because of figurines. So again, I I wouldn't be surprised if they go back earlier. But I mostly why they're known and why I've seen information about them is because of the plethora of figurines that are found in those in those contexts. So it doesn't help with us chronologically. Um, and if if I'm right about what figurines mean, then there is a little bit of palace control over the the material record of what's being actually used and offered in in these sanctuaries even at the, you know, the full rural uh, context. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that definitely sounds very plausible. Whenever you see this uh, standardization of material culture, it almost always seems to indicate uh, a, an expansion of the elite into that particular domain. And they take away um, a lot of like the, the cultural uh, energy or almost mm -hmm. from 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 th those particular domains, and so people kind of end up getting stuck with very standardized objects, and they have to work within a, what much more fixed standardized framework than than previously. Um, I can only conclude, Kim, that you have basically solved a gene religion, because I did not see any further questions coming from anybody. Um, at all. Well, it's been a long day. It's been a long day for everyone. <laughs> so congratulations for being able to Thank you very much. do that. I mean, as I say, that was a fantastic talk. And this is often the way when you have a, a fantastic talk like that, that it's incredibly difficult to try and respond with questions immediately because there's so much to take in. You want to digest it. I wouldn't be surprised if you get one or two emails in the next few days. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Day. Kim, I finally thought my question. question. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, can, I can only thank you again. I mean, it was so kind of you to agree to uh, give our keynote um, lecture. Uh, and um, despite having to work with the very difficult time zones, we're nine hours apart from each other here, which makes things so much more complicated. So, you know, thank you very much for, uh, for fitting in with the difficult scheduling and, um, you know, sure. congratulations. And at this point in time, yeah. there would of course be a massive round of applause. Um, and I'm sure yeah. everybody's thinking it. It's a virtual fun. one with all the little hand clapping. That's great. Exactly. That's great. Yes. I, went, the, I just want to also say that that although obviously I've been working on this for, for a long time, I, I want to just do a shout out to some of my students who have who are have also are following the conference and really have have been um, an intrinsic part of the development of these ideas through our through our seminars and our work and their their future work. I can't wait. The many of them are going to take these ideas and run with it. So I'm very, very excited about that. The best ideas are always bounced off multiple people. So absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, attending today. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed the first day uh, of, the, of the conference. We welcome you, obviously, to join us again tomorrow at, hang on one second. Um, so our first presentation will be at 11.30 Warsaw time. So please do change to whichever time zone you happen to be on in order to, uh, to be there. And our opening session will be about identity in the uh, Aegean. And it looks like everybody needs to bring along more coffee tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah, so we look forward to seeing you all. Thank you for participating and uh, thank you very much for being here. And thank you once again, Kim, thank you. Absolutely, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you and good night, everyone. <laughs>